Hello, everyone. This is Tracy Zimmerman. I'm the Executive Director of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. I am incredibly excited that we are able to offer this webinar today on the Every Student Succeeds Act and looking at new opportunities for birth through third grade alignment and funding and that we have amazing presenters with us today, which I will get to shortly. Um, we do have a hashtag for today, so you see that on the screen in front of you. It's uh, hashtag E-S-S-A-N-C, so please uh, use that should you be tweeting. We're going to start um, with just a quick poll to get a sense of um, who, where people are, what space people are working in. And so you should see up on the screen now um, where your area of focus is. And so we, we recognize that some folks hopefully are spanning the birth through eight space, but this will um, give us a, an idea of where your main focus is. I'll just give a few seconds to fill that out. All right. So we can see that we have about um, three fourths of folks are in the birth to five space, and about a, a little over a quarter are in K through 12. So that's great. Um, we have um, a good mix and. We can um, use that as we move forward. If you have questions, we're going to take them at the end. We've set aside ample time to address questions. You'll see there is a question um, uh, section uh, in your control panel, and you can type those questions in and send them privately, and then we will address them um, moving forward at the end of the um, presentations. So first up, we have Laura Bornfriend. She is Director of Early and Elementary Education Policy at New America. And if you do not follow um, at, uh, New America's Early Ed Central blog, I highly, highly recommend it. There is amazing information included in there. Laura authored the report, An Ocean of Unknowns, Using Student Achievement Data to Evaluate Pre-K Through Third Grade Teachers. Getting in Sync, Revamping Licensing and Preparation for Teachers in Pre-K, Kindergarten, and the Early Grades, and was the lead author on the reports from Crawling to Walking, Ranking States on Birth Through Third Grade Policies that Support Strong Readers, and just as a separate plug, we are thrilled that we will be bringing Laura down um, to present on that at the Smart Start Conference in May, so look out for that. And also lead author on Beyond Subprime Learning, Accelerating Progress in Early Education. Before joining New America, she worked with several policy organizations in Washington, D.C., including the Institute for Educational Leadership, the Forum for Education and Democracy, and Common Core, now known as Great Minds. Before moving to D.C., Laura worked for the City of Orlando, helping to implement its Paramore Kids Zone, an initiative modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone. She began her career as a fourth grade teacher in Orlando, Florida, and has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Central Florida. And she is the parent of an almost four-year-old, so she knows of what she speaks. So I am going to turn this over to Laura. And Laura, hopefully now you are able to fast forward forward through the slides. Okay, thank you, Tracy, for the introduction and for organi organizing this webinar. I'm happy to be here with you all today to talk about the opportunities within the Every Student Succeeds Act. And Tracy, just to, to let you know, I don't have access, so if you can advance for me, that would be great, and I'll let you know when I'm ready to advance. Um, okay. Oh, actually, never mind. I just popped uh, access, I think. Um, nope, you can keep doing it. All right. So before we um, jump too far into the presentation, the um, just some background on ESSA. Uh, you know, this was made law in December, and now the federal government has the 
the important job of writing the regulations for the law and states have to begin thinking about implementation. All ESSA provisions take effect for the 2017-2018 school year, so just a little more than a year from now. And while that may seem a ways away, it's, it's absolutely not. There's a lot of work to be done at the local, state, and federal level between now and then. Some states have already begun holding listening sessions with stakeholders across the state. Some states like North Carolina will begin doing this quite soon, and others may hold off a bit longer. There are some big changes in the law, including more flexibility overall and a shift of authority in many areas from the federal government to state and local school districts, or LEAs. The law also introduces several opportunities to expand state's focus on early childhood education. The majority of these opportunities are optional, meaning states can do them, but they are not required to do so. So we'll really take leadership by states and school districts and schools to make early childhood a priority. It also means that state and local stakeholders and early childhood advocates have the important job of helping to make a case for emphasizing pre-K and the early grades among the many other competing priorities states surely have. There is some good, good work underway in North Carolina. It's a race to the top early learning challenge state. The state received federal funds to develop new K through third grade formative assessments. Um, you know, grade level reading work is underway and there's some interest, we just learned from Tracy Legislature, um, to put forth legislation to strengthen coordination and develop a birth to eight vision. So this is all, these are all good things. The state, um, and there are ways that ESSA can support efforts to strengthen and build on the state's current birth to third grade work. And this is what we'll be talking more about today. So in front of you, you see Title I. Um, and this is in improving the academic achievement of the disadvantaged. And Title I includes several references to early childhood education, some new and some that were there before. Title I provides an opportunity for states and districts to revisit and strengthen what they are doing to ensure that all children, especially the most vulnerable children, have equitable education opportunities beginning before school entry. Um, you can move to the next slide. While there is not a lot of new in Title I at the state level with respect to early childhood programs, there are a few things worth noting. First, in their Title I plans that states must put together and submit to the federal government, they are required to explain how they will assist local school districts and individual schools that choose to use Title I dollars to provide early childhood education programs. This could include a range of passive to more active supports and will likely look very different depending on the state. And um, this is a, a new requirement um, for, for the state role. Second, as part of the law and part of previous iterations of the law, States must prepare and make available annual report cards that include information about the state's accountability system, the number of names of public schools identified for needing improvement plans, high school graduation rates, information on the number and percentage of English language learners, achieving English profici proficiency, and, and a number of other things. One of the new required data points is the number and percentage of students enrolled in preschool programs. It seems like this would include any program provided for children under the age of six, but it is something that will likely have additional uh, clarification in forthcoming uh, regulations. And third, has to do with the state's accountability system. Under ESSA, states must include at least one indicator of school quality that is not based on assessment. This is new. And the Ounce of Prevention Fund uh, put out a report earlier this year that calls attention to this change and how states can put a new emphasis on K2, perhaps, uh, in elementary schools. And we are fortunate uh, to have um, one of the authors, uh, Rio, on the webinar who will speak more to this opportunity in a little while. But just briefly, the school quality indicator may include measures of student engagement, educator engagement, school climate and safety, as well as any other indicator the state chooses that allows for meaningful differentiation in school performance and is valid, reliable, comparable, and statewide. Next slide, please. I think you might be able to do it now, Laura, if you'd like to try. There you go. I, I did, great. Um, 
So what's, what's new for local school districts? There is an updated section in Title I on parent and family engagement that allows LDAs, as they implement their family and parent engagement policies, to provide professional development opportunities that include early childhood educators, teachers, other teachers, principals, family members, and other school staff. There is also a new requirement for school districts to develop agreements with Head Start programs and when possible to do so, other early childhood education programs. And this, um, this is in an effort to share children's records from early childhood programs, improve communication between school staff and Head Start and early childhood education program staff to facilitate coordination, also to conduct joint meetings with parents, elementary school teachers, and appropriate pre-K program staff to discuss children's specific needs. It can also be um, you know, a way to hold joint transition-related training of school staff, Head Start program staff, and then when applicable, other early childhood education program staff, and then also to link educational services that are provided by school districts and local Head Start agencies. There has long been the requirement under the Head Start Act that Head Start programs establish an MOU with school districts to attempt to do some of these things, but until now there was not the reciprocal language in, um, uh, in ESSA, or in ESEA, now ESSA, to encourage and require really more meaningful two-way collaboration. And as they have, so these are additional things that um, are still included. So these aren't new, they're still included um, and things that are worth calling some attention to. As they've always been able to do, school districts and schools can continue to use Title I funds to provide early childhood education programs. Um, and when they choose to do so, the law states that they should ensure services comply with the educational requirements under the Head Start performance standards. Also, school district Title I plans must include a description of how the district will support, coordinate, and integrate early childhood programs, including helping children transition from pre-K into kindergarten. You'll see that this focus and emphasis on transition um, is really something that throughout throughout the law and, and, and um, something that has a, a, a stronger stronger focus. Um, for school-wide Title I programs and targeted assistance schools, they may implement strategies for smoothing transitions and to provide pre-K programs. There's some key differences between um, Title I school-wide programs and Title I targeted schools programs. When a, a school serves a population of 40% or more children from low-income families based on eligibility for the federal free and reduced lunch price, reduced price lunch program, then that school qualifies to offer a school-wide Title I program, which means services provided can serve all children within the school or in the attendance zone of the school, which means that there is no reason why schools couldn't use a mixed delivery service model um, for, for pre-K programs, really. Schools that do not meet that threshold may only use funds to specifically provide services for qualifying low-income children. So both types of schools can use funds to support strategies to help improve transitions for low-income children. School-wide programs can use funds to provide pre-K and other early childhood programs for any children in the school or tenants zone prioritizing low-income families. And targeted programs can use these dollars to provide pre-K and transition services only for eligible children from low-income families. Title II within the law, uh, preparing, training, and recruiting high quality teachers, principals, and other school leaders really offers some new opportunities for early childhood educators at both the state and local level. States can use Title II dollars to support opportunities for principals, other school leaders, teachers, paraprofessionals, early childhood education program directors, and other early childhood education program providers to participate in joint efforts to address the transition to elementary school, including improving children's school readiness. There are lots of things that states can do here, but one good example I see is thinking about um, elementary school principal preparation and certification and looking at redesigning what's in place to ensure 
that principals have the necessary early childhood knowledge and expertise to support better transitions, engage with other community early childhood providers, work with providers to improve school readiness, and to help kindergarten teachers use appropriate instructional strategies to sustain and build on what children have learned prior to school entry. Illinois is a good state to explore. They have done a lot of work to revamp their principal preparation, including weaving early childhood throughout many courses that principals are required to take before becoming a principal and requiring practical experiences and demonstrated competencies. And I think this, this uh, new um, provision within ESSA is, is one route to sort of use some, some uh, federal dollars to, to engage in this kind of work. Title II also includes a new $160 million literacy initiative for states to improve literacy instruction called Literacy Education for All, Results for Nation, or LEARN. The purpose of this program is to improve student academic achievement in reading and writing by providing funding for states to develop, revise, or update their comprehensive literacy instruction plans uh, to ensure high quality instruction and effective strategies in both reading and writing from early education through grade 12. And this includes um, states being required to conduct a assessment of their of students' literacy needs. Funding will be competitively, competitively awarded to uh, state education agencies that, um, who, which will then give subgrants to districts, early childhood programs, or a combination of the two. States are able to um, hold back up to 5% of their funds for um, providing technical assistance to local grantees, coordinating with um, higher education to improve teacher preparation in literacy instruction, updating licensing standards for literacy, and making information about promising approaches available for really cross-district learning um, and even more broadly to, to, um, to benefit the, the general public and the other um, you know, early childhood program providers. This uh, LEARN has many similarities to the current Striving Readers program that funds uh, six states to create a comprehensive literacy program for all children birth through 12th grade. And right now, uh, under that program, Georgia, Louisiana, Montana, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Texas receive um, funds, but every state receives small grants to develop a, a statewide literacy plan. So LEARN can really help um, states to update that plan um, and revisit revisit some, some needs, literacy needs. States um, will then use remaining funds beyond the, the, the 5% to make targeted subgrants to, as I mentioned, early childhood education programs, school districts, uh, to implement evidence-based programs. And there's a, a focus on evidence-based initiatives here that ensure high quality, comprehensive literacy instruction birth through third grade. Under LEARN, there are three separate subgrant divisions, birth to school entry, 15% of the funds are allocated here, and states must work with early childhood advisory councils and other agencies or offices um, at the state level working on early learning to award these subgrants. There's a, a subgrants for K through fifth grade, 40% of the funds are allocated there, and funds for 40% um, of the funds are allocated for 6th through 12th grade initiatives. So for the birth to kindergarten entry subgrants, subgrantees, funds can be used to um, focus on high quality professional development for uh, early childhood educators, um, you know, train providers and personnel to develop and administer these evidence-based early childhood uh, literacy initiatives, coordinate involvement of families and uh, early childhood educators in, in literacy development and provide targeted early childhood comprehensive literacy instruction for high need young learners. At the K, K to fifth grade level, subgrantees will be able to, to use their funds to really develop and implement comprehensive literacy instruction plan across all content areas. Um, provide intervention and support in reading and writing for ch children who are below grade level and support activities that are provided not just within school, the school day, but also out of school hours. They can also provide high quality professional development, um, 
coordinate and engage families in literacy development and train educators to develop, administer, and evaluate these uh, literacy initiatives. And then there are other allowable uses for all K through 12th grade subgrantees. Um, they can hire and train literacy coaches, help to, to build connections between um, out of school and in school learning, training families and caregivers to support adolescent literacy, and provide multi tier systems of support, such as response to, to intervention, as one example, form school literacy leadership teams to help implement, assess, and identify uh, necessary changes that might need to be made to literacy initiatives, and provide planning time, which is really important. Teachers don't have enough planning time uh, for teachers and, and other staff to meet on the comprehensive leadership instruction. LEARN has been established and authorized under ESSA, but Congress will still need to appropriate the money for the program um, and doesn't necessarily have to appropriate what was authorized. So we'll, we'll see what, what happens with, with um, this program. So what's new for local school districts? Well, at the local level, uh, school district professional development plans may include a focus on early grade teachers and principals, as well as other early childhood educators. Some of the allowable examples under the law include improving early grade instructional knowledge and child progress measurement for teachers, principals, and school leaders, improving the ability of principals and other school leaders to meet needs of children through age eight, and providing joint learning and planning on transition for school staff and early childhood educators. And this definitely makes it clear that, to me, that pre-K teachers on elementary school campus can be included in school professional development opportunities and can be included in transition planning activities um, and data curriculum and assessment discussions that might happen in the, among early grade teachers. Pre-K teachers should be part, part of those. Um, it also definitely opens the door to doing these same kinds of activities with early childhood providers not in the school building, uh, those that typically feed into an elementary school. All of these activities are really important. As I you know, previously sort of discussed, principals are a critical piece of improving quality in the early grades and helping to improve their knowledge of what's appropriate in pre-K and early grade classrooms can help them um, provide better feedback and instructional support to teachers. Districts could provide, um, with Title II dollars, districts could provide targeted professional development opportunities to improve principals' knowledge of early childhood development and appropriate instruction and even host joint learning sessions between uh, principals and directors of community pre-K programs. Additionally, the opportunities for joint learning and planning is important for really bringing some continuity between public school and community-based pre-K programs and um, what's happening in kindergarten. But as I mentioned before, it's important to remember that these are only allowable activities, not required activities, and they are competing against many other allowable activities um, for, for, title, for Title II dollars for professional development, including class size reduction, which is an, another allowable use under this pot of money. And this traditionally, um, just a, across school districts across the country, has been a significant use of, of these dollars to reduce those class sizes. And then at the federal level, um, also new under Title II, the, the US Secretary of Education may award competitive grants or contracts for innovative approaches to literacy, including uh, pediatric literacy programs where medical providers are trained in research-based early language and literacy promotion, books are provided for families and recommendations to parents about um, how to do strong read-alouds, services are provided during well visits, and uh, start uh, these programs start serving families in infancy. So this sounds um, you know, a lot like read, Reach Out to Read. There might be other programs that would, would benefit from this. Um, but also under the same section, the secretary could invest in improving and expanding school library programs. So it's another opportunity. The rest of these slides I'm going to scoot through fairly quickly. Um, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about Title III, Title IV, and some opportunities in Title IX. So Title III is 
the language instruction for English learners and immigrant students. And uh, briefly, things that are oops, okay, there we go. Um, there is, it is not much new um, within Title III, except for that it's more explicitly and clearly stated that these funds can be used um, to support what happens before uh, kindergarten entry. So in the National Professional Development Project, which has been around for several years, um, funds or this, this project um, awards competitive grants to institutes of higher education or public-private entities with relevant experience and capacity. Um, the purpose is to provide professional development that improves classroom instruction for English learners. And among other things, funds can be used to support school readiness of English learners and their transition from early childhood programs. Um, for state and locals, under the English Language Acquisition, Language Enhancement, and Academic Achievement Formula Grants, states can make subgrants to an eligible entity to develop and implement new language instruction programs, academic content instruction programs for English learners and immigrant children um, and youth pre-K through 12th grade. And then the other piece that's uh, for um, school districts is they must include assurances to coordinate um, with Head Start and other early childhood providers as appropriate around supports for English learners. There are lots of changes in new programs in Title IV, which is titled 21st Century Schools. I'm just going to briefly highlight three. So first, while No Child Left Behind included federal dollars for charter schools, um, you know, ESSA says that federal funds can support charter schools that serve early childhood, elementary school, or secondary school students. And this could encourage some states to update their own charter school laws to, um, you know, allow dollars, state dollars to be used for, for early childhood. At least that's, that's one of the things that, that I'm hopeful of, of here. Um, the, the, the new law ESSA also authorizes Promise Neighborhoods and full service community schools. These federal programs have also been around for several years, but they were never a part of No Child Left Behind. Now they are codified in um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And both programs include um, a, a funds being allowed for pipeline services. And the way that, that pipeline services are discussed within the law, um, they include things like high quality early childhood education programs, support for child's transition to elementary school, as well as other transition points along the way, family and community engagement and support, and social health, nutrition, and mental health services and support. Promised neighborhood applicants must show how they will provide these services, um, these pipeline services. And again, that while there is money authorized for these programs um, and, and others in the law, Congress is really the one who will just that, that will decide how much funding um, these programs will actually get. Title IX uh, includes our discussions of education for the homeless and other laws. And so for the first time, school districts must ensure that homeless children have access to Head Start early intervention services and other EC programs administered by the district. You know, these children are some of our most vulnerable, and so making sure that they can secure slots in these programs and access services is critical. But families might not readily know the services and programs of, are available to them, and so we'll take districts and, 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 and schools where possible actively stepping up to identify and recruit homeless families and help them to get needed developmental screenings for early intervention and enrolled in early childhood education programs. So I think, you know, an assurance is one thing, but, but you know, acting to, to actually make this, this happen is, um, is, is another. And 
So here, uh, one of the, the, the final things I'll, I'll talk about within the law is the preschool development grants. And I know many um, have been thrilled to really see this included as part of Every Student Succeeds Act. And while this program's inclusion in the law is definitely a step forward for further expansion of early ed opportunities and a recognition that children's education, their learning doesn't begin at kindergarten, it's much earlier. Um, it's not exactly what I or, or some others would have hoped for. First, it's really somewhat of a departure from the existing preschool development and expansion grants that really focus on improving quality and expanding spots for children from low and middle income families. So the purpose of what's in ESSA is to develop, update, or implement a strategic plan for high quality early learning within a state, encourage partnerships and coordination in program delivery and maximize parental choice. Uh, some other things to know about uh, this, this new program is that where in the existing preschool development grants, the Department of Ed is taking the lead and collaborating with HHS, it's reversed in this law. And so um, Health and Human Services, ACF is um, now the lead uh, agency and in will work in partnership with the Department of Ed to administer this program. There are two types of grants. There's initial one-year grants for states and then renewal grants that uh, can be awarded up to uh, three years. And then um, just finally grants are to the states and then states can make sub-grants to uh, local entities. So for the initial grants, States must use dollars to conduct a needs assessment on the availability and quality of existing early childhood programs within the state, develop a strategic plan to address um, needs that, that aren't currently being met, to uh, maximize parental choice and parent knowledge about programs and providers um, in a mixed delivery system, a share best practices among early childhood education providers, including on improving the transition into kindergarten. And then after all of those previous activities have been completed, then states uh, must focus on improving the overall quality of early childhood education programs within the state. For the renewal grants, um, eligible states include initial grantees or pre-ESSA preschool development grantee grant awardees. States can opt to continue activities started under the initial grant. They can um, also award the subgrants to programs in a mixed delivery system across the state designed to benefit low-income and disadvantaged children. And these subgrantees would then be required to um, implement activities to address areas uh, in, need in, in need of improvement and expand access to existing programs or develop new programs to address the needs of children and families eligible for but not served by existing programs if the state ensures it's expanding that mixed delivery system and supplementing and not supplanting other public dollars. One um, big change under what this will, will look like is what the um, you know, federal government can and, and cannot say around um, elements of quality. So under the law, the federal government cannot establish any criterion for grants that specifies, defines, or prescribes any of these um, things. So around early learning and development guidelines, standards, or specific assessments, uh, around specific measures or indicators of quality early learning or care, um, including they cannot uh, define what high quality is. They cannot, um, you know, define or, or require specific early learning or preschool curriculum or programs of instruction. Um, can't say anything about uh, teacher and staff qualifications and salaries, class sizes and ratios of children to instructional staff. Cannot make any new requirements that an early childhood education program be required to meet. They can't. Uh, give um, requirements or definitions around the scope of programs, which includes length of program day or length of um, program year, or any other aspect or parameter of teacher, principal, 
other school leaders, staff evaluation system within a state, local educational agency, or early childhood education program. So there's a lot of restrictions here. Um, this is really, as I mentioned, a big departure from the current preschool development grant program that does have requirements um, or guidance on nearly all of these areas. There have been um, just generally lots of questions about what ESSA means for existing preschool development grantees. Um, what I can say is that the law pro does provide time and authority for the Department of Ed to work with state and local partners um, to ensure a smooth and orderly transition. Um, and the Department of Ed will post additional information as becomes available on their SOI website, just generally about how um, PDG or other um, things in, in SR are moving forward. So to wrap up, some important things to keep in mind about the opportunities within the law are, as I've said uh, a few times, uh, most of what's in the law related to early learning is discretionary. States and local districts have new options, new opportunities, but these are not requirements. And when state capacity, resources, expertise are limited, the easiest option is to continue operating as usual. I think here in North Carolina, there is uh, some strong early learning leadership in the state. There's also some good work, local work underway. And I think ESSA provides opportunities to expand that work, especially around um, improving transitions between pre-K and, uh, and kindergarten. There is a lot in the laws we've heard related to children's transition from birth to five programs into kindergarten. Both Title I and Title II dollars can be used to foster better connection, connections um, across what happens before, during, and after kindergarten and support um, you know, teachers in, and, and leaders in um, supporting children's learning across that, that continuum. Two, there are areas where states are required to include feedback from the early ed community, but not everywhere within the law. And so that means it's, it's especially important to find a way to be a part of conversation. Uh, find out when listening sessions or um, public you know, comment sessions are happening. Checking the state website to see if there's uh, places to submit comments or feedback on different provisions in the law. And then third, just a, a note that you know, Title I funds, as I said, have always been able to be allowed to, to support programming for children beginning at birth, but investment before kindergarten has been historically low. The percent often cited is about 3% of children receiving Title I services um, are below the age of kindergarten entry. So I think ESSA provides a renewed opportunity to make the case for additional investment with a focus on providing high quality programs for the young children who need them most and connecting those programs to kindergarten and the early grades to help ensure smooth transitions and instruction that builds on what children are, already know and are able to do. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Laura, so much for all of that wonderful information. I see that some questions are coming in, which is fantastic. Use the question um, box and we will uh, address those uh, at the end because I'm very pleased that we also have Rio uh, Romero Gerardo. Um, she is a policy analyst for the Ounces National Policy Team. She supports the team's consultation activities to state and local communities by conducting policy research and analysis and early learning as well as support the collective policy and advocacy work of the Educare Learning Network. Rio has worked in public policy in the areas of early childhood, public health, and human services. Rio previously research and policy coordinator at the Texas Early Childhood Education Coalition, where she wrote about the importance of high quality early education initiatives in the state. She also provided program support at the National Women's Law Center in Washington, D.C. In 2012, Rio served as a mayoral fellow for the city of Chicago studying issues of early education, human services programming, and public education reform. She has a master's degree from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration and a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and Family Sciences with a certificate in social inequality, health, and policy from the University of Texas, Austin. And so I'm going to uh, advance that to you. And Rio, give me one second, and I should you should, let's see, uh, 
now be able to have control, hopefully, of the slides if you move your mouse. So thank you, Rio, for okay. joining us. Thanks, Tracy, for the introduction and more for the great overview. I'm going to see if I can advance my slides really quick. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Ounce of Prevention Fund and my co-authors, Elliot Reagenstein and Maya Connor, who unfortunately could not be here today, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you our recent paper released in February, as Laura mentioned, which discusses how states can use this new opportunity under ESSA to improve the early elementary grades and even pre-kindergarten education by ensuring that those years are meaningfully weighted in state accountability systems and by using metrics of school quality that support best practices in those critical years. Now, I believe you may all have received a copy of our publication in advance. At the end of the presentation, I've included a link to the paper as well for anyone who would still like to get access to the full version and executive summary. I've organized today's conversation to first briefly refresh what Laura mentioned about what's new for seeing a for state accountability systems under ESSA. Second, we'll reflect on state accountability systems under No Child Left Behind, or NCLB. And third, we will unpack this new opportunity under ESSA to create meaningful accountability in the years mm -hmm. prior to third grade and what it can mean for states and local school districts. Lastly, we'll wrap up our discussion by highlighting the key takeaways from the paper. State accountability systems are potentially significant influences on local action. They outline a set of policies and practices that a state uses to measure how schools are performing for students, reward those that are serving all their students well, and prompt improvement in those that are not. We know that advocates for robust accountability systems have frequently identified the major goal of their advocacy as being improved outcomes for low-income and minority students. Although there may be disagreement about how effective accountability systems have been at achieving that goal, regardless, many agree that accountability systems have the power to drive local behavior. ESSA opens up new possibilities for elementary school accountability that were not previously included in federal law. Under, the, under ESSA, states will continue to be required to maintain school accountability systems, but the federal parameters for those systems have changed substantially. Instead of the dominating focus on test proficiency in third grade and up under NCLB, the federal statute now requires states to incorporate multiple types of assessment indicators and a new indicator of school quality or student success, which I'll refer to from here as the school quality indicator. This offers states the opportunity to create new incentive structures that encourage local education leaders to take actions that are likely to lead to improved educational outcomes. Now, there are many ways that states can do this, but one specific opportunity is to take new approaches that put greater focus on the pre-third grade years of K-2 or even pre-K. I'll talk more in a few about the specific strategies states could use to make sure that educators have incentives to focus on the years before third grade. Increasingly, educators understand that in many low-performing school districts, the achievement gap opens before kindergarten entry. We've seen this in research that has observed that these differences in learning emerge as early as 18 months and persist through the school years. Many of you here are familiar with a graph from the landmark study by Hart and Ridley that found that the average child on welfare was having half as much early vocabulary experience per hour as the average working class child and less than one third that of the average child in a professional family. We know that this is important because vocabulary development during the preschool years is related to later reading skills and school success in general. Thus, the first five years of life provide an incredibly important opportunity to impact long-term child outcomes with the quality and quantity of responsive interaction with adults a critical factor in helping children get on the right trajectory. While many in education understand the research about the importance of the early years, we know that under No Child Left Behind, state accountability systems measure the quality of elementary schools largely through test scores in third grade enough, and thus discourage this addressing the achievement gap early. 
local district decision makers also knew that test scores were the primary metrics of their, of their success and that preschoolers were at least four years from taking accountability tests. In that time period, a district superintendent or principal leadership might change. Studies have found that the average tenure of superintendents is less than four years and often shorter in low performing districts. This means that children in preschool during the first year of a district leader's tenure likely will not take any standardized test until a new leader has come in. Additionally, students themselves might move to another community. Research on school change indicates that just over half of kindergartners remain in the same school by the end of third grade. This creates incentives for a district to focus on their efforts, primarily on the children whose test scores will impact their district's accountability results. Moreover, MLB's focus on later years are reflected in how accountability system test one encouraged the assignment of future teachers to untested grades, where they may be seen as having less impact on the school's test scores, and two, have not played a significant role in supporting school efforts to partner with early learning providers in the community. In sum, the entire accountability and structure, incentive structure under NCLB has pushed local educators to focus on short-term fixes rather than on long-term improvements that can be seeded in the years before a third grade. And while some districts have taken the long view and launched impressive early learning or third grade reading initiatives, many have succumbed to the pressure of their metrics and focused resources for improvement on the tested years. But with states engaging in major overhauls of their accountability system, now is the time to ensure that accountability and sense of support rather than impede best practices in the years prior to third grade. Under ESSA, the school quality indicator offers a real chance for states to put their thumb on the scale in favor of earlier investment so that local educators can build high quality education systems from birth to third grade and be rewarded for it in a state accountability system. Outlined here will be two major steps we think states should take to bring the early elementary grades of K-2 under the accountability tent. First, to maximize the impact of the school quality indicator, states should consider using measures that focus directly on the quality of professional practice and the key systems behind it. For too long, accountability systems have focused on what is easily measured, not necessarily what matters the most. As mentioned prior, we know that what matters most to children in the early elementary grades is the quality of their interactions with teachers, and accountability systems should include measures of professional practice in the school quality indicator. Measuring the quality of teaching is not new practice. Indeed, scientifically validated and reliable observational tools have been used to measure the quality of teaching in classrooms across the U.S. In preschool, scores from these observations are used in a variety of ways, including ensuring that Head Start programs meet federal quality standards, determining state quality rating and improvement system scores for early learning programs, and informing professional development and quality improvement efforts. Tools such as the Classroom Assessment Scoring System, Class Pre-K, have been used to monitor, publicly rate, and improve the quality of preschool classrooms for many years. Similarly valid and reliable observational tools, such as the class K-3 and Danielson framework, can be used effectively to rate and improve the quality of teaching in elementary school classrooms nationwide. In addition, the school quality indicator should include other measures of systemic quality and organizational conditions that have been linked to practices that are most important for students' learning. An example of this is an approach to practice-based accountability grounded in the five essential elements identified by the Consortium on Chicago School Research as critical to school success. These include, for example, a coherent instructional guidance system, professional capacity, strong care community school ties, a student-centered learning climate, and leadership to drive change. A robust school quality indicators that include these factors will provide more valuable information to help support meaningful ongoing improvement. Can you go to the next slide? I think I might have lost. There it is. Thank you. It's important to note that instructional quality is something that can be measured in every grade 
So it allows the early elementary years to be put on an equal footing with later years. Moreover, designing this indicator can foster a statewide conversation about what is actually best instructional practices in the K-2 years, a conversation that is sorely overdue in most states. Developing a greater statewide understanding of what quality teaching looks like in the early years would have significant value to educators and a state-level commitment to including classroom instructional quality in the school quality indicator could help facilitate the process of building knowledge and capacity in this area, as well as spark the development of innovative new observational tools that more precisely measure the elements of teaching that matter the most. The second strategy states should consider using to make the early years count is to use indicators that can be disaggregated by grade, then place equal or greater weight on the K-2 years, an example of which you will see on the next slide. One of the successes of NCLB that was carried into ESSA is a focus on disaggregating data when aggregated data might mask disparities in performance among different groups of students. The same spirit can animate the design of the school quality indicator. States should require the disaggregation of data within the school quality indicator to highlight the quality of education that schools are delivering at each grade level. Doing so will allow for the of an accountability system that places sufficient weight on the quality of education in the early elementary years to make it meaningful to the school's overall rating and incentivize high quality instruction for the youngest students. As mentioned, a state could choose to place additional weight on the K-2 years because there are no other indicators for those years whereas there are for the later years. For example, using the same 70-30 split between the assessment indicators and the school quality indicators, a state could choose to weigh the school quality indicator for K-2 at 7% per year and grade 3 to 5 at 3% per year. This approach might be particularly valuable in states that place a heavy emphasis on growth within the assessment indicator. A growth indicator would give schools an incentive to put their best teachers in the test of grades and their weakest teachers in the early years, potentially the most effective strategy for showing growth. Here, states can place disproportionate emphasis on the instructional quality of the early elementary years, giving school leaders an incentive to put strong teachers in those grades. Focusing on K-2 is also an important step in helping schools become effective members of the local early learning community. When schools put focus on the early elementary grades, they are thinking about where their students' experiences were before entering kindergarten, and that's an opportunity that's not to be missed. In most communities, children who are enrolled in a mix of center-based preschools, Head Start programs, and home care arrangements. Schools may not have the capacity to build relationships with all of the early learning pro providers in the communities, but they can at least build relationships with those that serve the most children. They can also develop joint planning and professional development opportunities that fill the shared understanding of how to meet the needs of children and families. If states choose this approach of disaggregating data and weighing the K-2 years as part of their early elementary school accountability, they will face another important choice of whether to include preschool. Under the language of the FS, there is nothing to preclude states from including pre-K in a school school quality indicator. By including pre-K in their accountability systems, states would send a clear message that they value high quality early learning and expect schools to deliver that quality. However, there are some important considerations for states contemplating this option that includes reflecting on the state's funding approach, addressing funding outside of state formula, and thinking about whether or not all districts and schools provide pre-K. Additionally, if a state's accountability system makes it too hard for schools to improve their overall scores by providing pre-K, that might be a disincentive to providing pre-K in the first place. But if the state's accountability system makes it too easy for schools to improve their overall scores by providing pre-K, that might lead schools to offer low-quality pre-K, which isn't likely to 
to produce positive long-term impacts. In this case, the states will have to be careful about striking that right balance. Given that most states have some existing systems for rating the quality of early learning, it will also be important for states to ensure alignment with early learning accountability. Aligning early learning and K-12 accountability systems is an outstanding opportunity to strengthen the connections between schools and early learning and to reinforce best practices that affect the entire first and third grade continuum. Finally, we think it's important to be realistic about these ideas. What is being suggested here has never been tried at scale, and if states attempt to design a system of this type, it will take active engagement in the process by multiple stakeholders, and a recognition that states will have to revisit these systems over time based on what they are learning and implementation. So in closing, accountability systems are critical levers of state policy that have had significant impact on local decision making. As they grapple with how to implement every student's feedback, they can consider designing school quality indicators that measure instructional quality and or disaggregate scores by grade, which may change the incentives for local educators in their approach to the K-2 grade. Ultimately, states now have the unique opportunity under SF to chart better ways forward by encouraging and supporting improved practice at the early elementary level and earlier and equally important, foster stronger connections between early learning and K-12 school systems. I wanna thank Tracy, the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation, and everyone here on the call for the opportunity to participate in today's webinar. My colleagues and I are actually really happy to connect with anyone who may have any questions or comments on the paper. We're also happy to be helpful thought partners on this topic as you engage in the effort process here in your state, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tracy. Thank you so much, Rio. This has been, I know, a tremendous amount of information. Um, and so we do have questions coming in. And actually, I'm going to go back um, to one slide because the first question, Laura, is for you and asking you if you could just briefly recap um, the birth to kindergarten um, uh, opportunities through LEARN. Sorry, I had myself on, uh, on, on mute. Um, so for birth to kindergarten entry subgrantees, um, funds can be used for uh, providing high quality professional development for early childhood educators um, to train providers and personnel to, de to develop and administer those evidence-based early childhood education literacy initiatives. So, uh, you know, come up with something that's uh, new that's based on evidence or, or implement an existing program um, that has good, good solid evidence behind it. Coordinate the involvement of families um, and early childhood educators in literacy development of early of, uh, of children. So, um, you know, family engagement, but engagement that's really focused on um, literacy, how families can, um, you know, work on literacy types of um, activities at home with kids, and then provide targeted early childhood comprehensive literacy instruction for high need young, young learners. Great, thank you, Laura. This, this next one is also for you. Um, the question is, who receives the LEARN funds? Is it any state agency or the governor's office or just the state education agency? State education agency um, receives it from the federal government, and then they make the subgrantees to eligible eligible entities, which um, could be um, early childhood program providers and likely other uh, non nonprofit organizations that are providing some early childhood services. Um, okay, so the next one is since um, ACF is the lead agency for the preschool development grants. Does that mean funds will run through state HHS agencies or, again, through state education? So would it be through Health and Human Services or through education at the state level? At the state level, 
it will depend on how the state, um, I, I believe it'll depend on how the state has, has it structured. So if the, um, the, the Department of Ed is the, the lead agency, then it could run through there. If the, the Department of Health and Human Services or an equivalent at the, the state level was the lead agency, then funds would, would run through there. Okay. This next question is a little bit long, so bear with me. Um, it says, local districts across the nation struggle to provide developmentally appropriate, engaging, play-based kindergarten experiences in many places. Many of the reasons for this shift come from the focus on testing and more didactic literacy instruction. Um, I heard Laura mention earlier the importance of kindergarten programs building on the types of experiences children are having in early childhood education programs. My question is, are there even more explicit instructions or recommendations as part of ESSA or instructions, or, I'm sorry, or other federal policies that support more appropriate instruction in kindergarten programs? As someone who is working to support kindergarten teachers in providing more appropriate experiences but feels pushed back against it, I would appreciate any information or recommendations from the federal level. There are, are actually, I mean, within the law, there is not much more specifics on um, what states or local school districts should do. It's really um, just focused on increasing the knowledge base um, of teachers, principals, other leaders on instruction in the early grades. So um, that to me is an opportunity to provide, in, to help build knowledge at the, the school level on what appropriate, appropriate instruction um, would look like, especially in, you know, kindergarten classrooms, but even, you know, first, second, and third grade, that it shouldn't just be um, teacher-directed instruction, that, um, you know, play is certainly an, an opportunity to use as a, a tool for building children's learning in a variety of ways. And so it doesn't, there is not guidance um, or there's not requirements within the law. Um, I mean, there there could be some um, either, it, it probably not in official regs, but in non-binding um, guidance that comes out from the Department of Ed. There may be some possibilities uh, to see what what um, could be be done in in Title II. That's more uh, talking about what you're doing, but it's it's really gonna be left up to the state and local school districts to sort of interpret if they're going to use dollars um, in, in that way. And so those, those who are in the field that really know what this should look like, it's, it's you know, I think up to, up to early childhood advisory councils and, and the rest of the early childhood field within a, within a state to um, make the case for what um, that instruction uh, should should look like and how uh, professional development dollars can be used for teachers and principals to improve um, appropriate instruction in early grade classrooms. Okay, thank you. So the next question is about this slide and is, is broad and just uh, wants if you have any uh, insights as to why the federal government isn't or can't establish these criteria. It's largely um, political reasons that that I think Congress um, frustrated with Department of Ed overreach with um, you know no, waivers from No Child Left Behind um, and it didn't want um, the federal government telling states and and um, you know local programs what they should specifically be doing, but leaving uh, flexibility to states and locals to decide um, what, what they deem and, and recognize as, as, as high quality. Um, but largely, I think it's, you know, it's, it's political reasons. It's, it's some, you know, backlash from No Child Left Behind waivers, from um, Common Core, and, and there is throughout the law, not just here, but um, throughout ESSA, there's language that limits the secretary's authority from um, defining and, and, and prescribing specific 
uh, specific things within within the law. Um, lots of lots more flexibility and interpreta interpretation left up to states and uh, local school districts. Great. Um, lots of folks are asking about copies of the presentation. Um, yes, we will have the the webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to see it that way, and we will share. Um, a PDF of, of the presentation. So the next question is, let's see, a critical focus on administrator, district level, and elementary principles, understanding of effective practices in K-2 is in many ways the missing link. I'm thrilled to hear that it is encouraging that focus. Let's see. As a local district central office kindergarten consultant, what resources are available for professional development for administrators and what other strategies are being used to help administrators understand learning in grades K through three? So I, I think um, there are some other states and you know local school districts that have different uh, professional development programs um, to help build principles, especially knowledge in, in these areas. I mean, um, there's also a, a state, New Jersey, for instance, has has developed um, you know kindergarten implementation guide, but also first grade implementation guide around what like good quality practice should look like in in those those classrooms, um, and and so there's there are um, you know so that that's potentially one one resource, although that's that's focused more on on teachers, but I mean it's also a tool for principals to kind of get a, a sense of what um, instruction, what appropriate instruction looks like in the classroom. There's also um, through the, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, there is a um, pre-K through third grade um, uh, guide for principals who are looking to, to build early childhood communities within their, um, within their schools. And there's a number of competencies outlined in there um, that are important for principals to, to have. So that's a, you know, a national association website. But I know, you know, Washington, um, Minnesota, Illinois, there's, there's several other states that, um, and districts within the states that are building out some um, principal development kinds of, of programs and we'll be doing some some writing on those programs and releasing a series of principal briefs next month that will go into more detail about some of those yeah i absolutely agree i mean i would also add um thinking about reaching out to um your local early childhood um, advocacy organizations we're thinking a lot about these linkages um between early learning and k-12 as well as another resource Okay, um, the next question is, how much is available to states under LEARN? Can you repeat that? How much is available to states under LEARN? Oh, under LEARN. Do you have that available? Uh, so it's the, the program, I think I'm looking, just double checking my notes, it's a $160 million um, program overall, um, but the amount that would be specifically um, available to each state has not been yet determined. Okay, great. Um, and who is, makes the decisions about who gets those grants? Do we know that yet? It's within the, the department. Well, you mean which states get those grants? So it's, it's within the Department of Ed. So since it's competitively awarded, um, you know, just like striving readers, uh, it, it'll be some kind of, um, you know, grant program that's um, a competition that's put out there and states will be able to apply and then similar process. They'll likely have a, um, you know, a, a group put together who will go through and, and make recommendations about winning, um, which, which proposal should win, but ultimate decision would be um, sec Secretary of Education. Okay. Um, there's a question now about um, early education and uh, charter schools and wanting to know if that's an acceptable use of LEARN funds. Um, so to provide early childhood um, programs or pre-K program at a charter school? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what the question is? Well, LEARN is really 
focused on professional development around literacy instruction, um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think that there's anything that says that they that that charter schools couldn't be grantees for that. Um, but it, it also it doesn't say that that funds could be used to provide like a, a pre K program under learn at a charter school or anywhere. Okay, so I think we've covered um, the questions that have come in and I have a follow up question for both of you, which is what do you recommend? So we know that the um, community uh, conversations and listening will be starting, um, I believe, uh, later this week or for North Carolina and around the state. What else can early learning programs and K through 12, I mean, sorry, elementary schools, what do you recommend they begin doing to engage with one another on this? Rio, I'll let you start. I, I, I think it's just that is to really engage and be involved in the conversation. Um, I think right now there's so much, at least from the accountability standpoint, that we don't know about what happens in CQ, and it would be much better if we can learn more about that and build that into our definition of you know what a good grade school is. Um, and so to be involved in that process, I think is really important as as this. Uh, all you know just unfolds yeah I, I I would agree okay so last call for questions all right it looks like we will um, I, I don't see any more coming in uh, as I said we will post a recording uh, of the uh, website and share um, copies of the PowerPoint. Rio's handout is available, um, uh, the paper that she referenced. And I want to thank Laura and Rio so much for being willing to offer this opportunity uh, for folks in North Carolina. And um, we're really grateful for access to your expertise. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.